Welcome back, colleagues, uh, for our final panel of the day. Uh, so if there is um, one area, one policy area in which we might expect provincial level innovations, it has to be in the area of social policy, where constitutionally much of the responsibility actually resides at the provincial level. And historically, we have a number of demonstrations of the significance of provincial level innovation. And my own, the field that I study in health policy, of course, the quintessential example is Saskatchewan's role in pioneering uh, physician and hospital and universal physician and ho uh, hospital insurance. Uh, and more recently, Quebec has adopted a program of universal coverage for pharmaceuticals, which has yet to diffuse across the provinces. Um, but the organizers of this panel have, have selected three areas which are a little different in this regard, in which either constitutional responsibility is formally shared, as, as in the case of immigration, or in which the necessary tools are constitutionally held in different hands, as is the case in labor market and public health policy. So in a way, these may be the hardest cases in social policy in which to innovate at the provincial level. I'm not sure if that was the rationale in structuring the panel, uh, but it, uh, it certainly uh, makes some sense to me. And it, it suggests that we are, will be exploring the, uh, the potential and the limits of provincial innovation in a dynamic federalism. And on that point of dynamism, uh, I recently heard a reference to John Burroughs' point. Some of you may have heard this as well, a rather arresting point about how we should think about Canadian federalism. Not as a noun, but as a verb. Not as a reified set of allocated responsibilities, but as an ongoing dynamic of relationship. And I suspect that we might be hearing a bit of the verb uh, dimensions of federalism in the panel today. We have a, a terrific set of commentators to help us think through uh, these areas of immigration, labor market, and public health, respectively. Mireille Paquet is an assistant professor of political science at Concordia. She currently holds a prestigious William Lyon Mackenzie King postdoc at Harvard, uh, and she co-directs the Concordia Center for Immigration Policy Evaluation and works on the federalization of immigration, so well positioned for our panel. Sunil Johal, the policy director at MOET, uh, which involves him in overseeing research across a range of policy areas, as did his previous roles, senior roles in uh, policy and with the Ontario government. Uh, but most relevant to today's panel, he's the co-author of the MOAT study, uh, Working Without a Net, on the policy implications of the new world of work. And finally, Kumanen Wilson is a clinical epidemiologist, senior scientist at uh, the Ottawa Hospital and the University of Ottawa. And like a number of clinical epidemiologists of my acquaintance, I'm not sure what it is about the field, but Dr. Wilson's intellectual curiosity knows no bounds, I would say. Um, and uh, his current focus, however, is on digital health and especially its implications for uh, immunization and screening. So without further uh, ado from me, uh, let me just ask Mireille to uh, start us off. I'll give each of our discussants uh, about 10 minutes to uh, make the points that they wish to make. We'll then have a discussion uh, amongst the panelists of some common points that cut across the presentations and then uh, open it up for questions. We may 
I suspect, have time for fewer questions than in previous panels, given that we're a bit uh, truncated in our, in our time slot now. Um, but uh, we will, we'll, we'll see how it goes at the time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and instead of starting off by talking of innovation, I want to take us back a little bit by looking at what's going on. So kind of full circle, um, as is the team for this, um, for this event. So some of you might know that in November this month, the federal government released its immigration target for 2018, 2020. So it's been discussed mostly as uh, you know, a glad return to multi-year immigration uh, planning. Some other people have also talked about the high level of immigrations that are planned for years to come, just going back to what we were discussing after lunch. But to me, what we saw um, in November is especially interesting because of one important fe feature that wasn't really discussed um, in the coverage. That was provincial selection. By 2020, according to the targets, and I'm not going to go in all the tiny details of the number of people and the planned target or the actual targets, but it is estimated at about 53% of the economic immigrants coming to Canada will be selected by the provinces. So they're gonna be selected through the provincial nominee program, through the Atlantic pilot projects, but also through all the suites of program that the Quebec government has developed since the 1991. So to me, this is interesting on so many level, and as my research has demonstrated, basically the 2020 target comes at the end of a process through which provinces have become more interested and have become more capable in the area of immigration. And what we used to think about this, and probably that's how it was discussed in 1967, as a Quebec issue, right? As something that Quebec wanted, but that other provinces weren't that interested in. Uh, right now, uh, what we see is that other provinces have started to pick up steam when it comes to immigration. And that this has actually been going on in the last 15 to 20 years, depending on how you count. So immigration has become a new target of province building, which is the theme of uh, the panel this afternoon. Provincial government have identified migrants as a resource for the development of their economies, but also for the maintenance of their population. And so um, while the area of jurisdiction is actually shared when it comes to immigration and is a clear division of power, provinces also are taking a better kind of are having a better idea of what it means to have more immigrants for the education system, for the healthcare system, for the labor market management. So in addition to developing independent institution and policies, um, the result of this kind of waking up to immigration has been a growing mobilization from provinces to get Ottawa to change its policy of immigrant selection and to modify the governance practice in this policy sector. So today the result, um, and I say generally, is a generally mature set of infrastructure of intergovernmental relation in the immigration se sector. So help with working groups, agreement, programs, as well as changes in attitudes from Ottawa, uh, as well as from the provinces. And we go there back to this idea of federalism as a set of practices, right? It's also about making sure that you believe the person in front of you is capable and should do something. The two other government are speaking to one another. They're generating multilateral consensus it's a word that the Quebecer will never be able to say. And they're also managing crisis to a large extent quite well, as we've seen this summer with the first wave of, or last winter, I should say, in, with the first wave of border crossing, right? So there is a real kind of discussion that spans from operations are really on the ground, what are we gonna do about people crossing from the US to thinking through how are we gonna set up our multi-year immigration levels for years to come. Now, not everything is perfect, right? Um, there are tensions, for example, I can just think of growing tensions between Manitoba and Ottawa on this issue. I can think of issues as well with number of provincial nominees that are given to provinces annually. And there's always gonna be a tug of war when it comes to settlement funding and other kind of funding, because after all, this is federalism, right? So federalism also means a practice of disagreeing, but still talking. 
The point, however, is that in a matter of 25 years or 20 years, immigrant federalism in Canada has been transformed. It used to be something Ottawa and Quebec did to something all the provinces in Ottawa do. So the shared jurisdiction in immigration has become embodied in multilateral practices. This, I want to emphasize again, again, came true as a result of provincial effort, much more than true the result of a federal will to change. And it also came without a formal change to the Constitution. And the Quebecer in me, who still believes in federalism, or a couple, still there, um, to me that really shows the, the, the capacity of Canadian federalism to adapt, right, and to evolve as the interests of actors on the ground change. Um, and it doesn't have to come through a formal change, it can really come through changes in practices. And generally we see that it works, right? So in the space of a couple of years, several provinces have moved from have not provinces to have when it comes to immigration. It's important not to overemphasize that change, but still the story of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta is not just a story of changes in the economy, it's a story of a provincial government really making an effort to get people in. Locally sensitive integration policies that respond to the particularities of the provincial labor market have been developed in all of those provinces. Provincial policy innovation have also inspired federal policy change. So this is not a one direction kind of discussion. As we're in Ontario, we can also celebrate the fact that Ontario has now a new immigration agreement since uh, early in November, uh, which will codify the relationship between Ottawa and the province and increase the funding for economic integration. So things look pretty good, but more work remains to be done. Um, I still think that it's a pretty good start from where we were uh, at the last conference. But what now? And I think I just want to end with three point. Canada is facing a new immigration world. It's not just about getting people in and getting as more people as we want. It's also facing a growing uh, number of people that will keep crossing the border from the south, so this is not going to end. Uh, we're also facing the highest crisis of global displacement that the the herd has ever um, faced. And at the same time, a lot of the new governance of immigration that we're seeing in Canada remains practice dependent, right? So it remains a working consensus based on what people, um, what people like, right? So it, it is contingent on the goodwill of government. And as we know, the will of government can change at any moment. So I, I think that in addition to celebrating, which I think is important to see that how we can change the whole policy area in a relatively short amount of time, time, we should remain aware of three things. So the first one is that I think all of us, actors and uh, scholars or uh, just you know, people interested in this issue should recognize the deep interdependence of both other government when it comes to immigrant-related issues. So it's not just that the jurisdiction is formally divided. It's also that um, while Ottawa might have the last word about who comes in, the actual experience of newcomers in Canada is completely contingent on the will of provinces, right? So taking immigrant integration and it, as an example, everyone needs to keep on recognizing that proper integration it is contingent on provi for provincial areas of jurisdiction and not just on federal settlement or a federal integration program but also everybody needs to recognize that provinces depend on the maintenance of a consistent and effective immigration system. So I'm thinking here of things like the really long time that the people that came through uh, border crossing this summer are gonna face to get their asylum claim uh, process, right? So how is that actually gonna affect provinces? I'm thinking also of the decision really quickly done by the government in 2015 regarding the resettlement of Syrian refugees, which is a beautiful thing, but also uh, limited the capacity for policy coordination. Um, so managing deep interdependence has to go beyond partisan disagreement and disalignment too, right? Um, because this is, only, this is the only way that we're gonna be able to ensure proper outcomes for both immigrants, but also for uh, Canadian society as a whole who is expecting to 
you know, address a lot of policy challenges with the presence of new immigrants. The second thing I think we should remain aware of is that we are actually experiencing a really sensitive consensus. Um, and it's not just about what provinces in Ottawa think and whether they're able to talk to one another, but it's actually, to put it bluntly, that the current system works as long as we like immigrants, right? And some of us might think that uh, loving immigration is in the Canadian DNA. There's enough data and, and research to show that it's not as simple as that. Um, and so, um, this means basically in practice that the current governance of immigration where both Ottawa and the provinces work together remains possible as long as provinces themselves want immigrants and a lot of that is dependent on the health of fiscal federalism, right? So I'm gonna just explore this for a minute. So um, provinces, it's important to realize, became interested with immigration as economic and demographic resources. And they never really kind of move forward on this issue as something having to do with asylum, something having to do with helping people. I mean, it's always there in the background, but that wasn't the right objective. So their involvement in this policy area um, remains something that will work as long as provincial government are able to frame immigration as something that benefits the province and not as something that siphon um, the capacity of the province to provide social programs and manage other areas of jurisdiction. I'm not saying I agree with this, I'm just saying it as it is. So based on external, international experiences, especially what I'm seeing right now in the United States, this means that we need to pay a lot more attention to issues of interprovincial mobility and sec secondary migration, right? So migrants arriving in one provinces were then gonna move to another, something that Ontario has actually been talking about quite a lot uh, in the last 10 years. So dialogue and continued support is crucial to ensure that the different constraints and opportunities each government face in the sector are really understood by all the actors. And my last point is, um, a little sad, you know, but it's to acknowledge that we are still engaged in executive federalism, albeit in a different form. So we've seen a growing involvement of new actors in this policy area, but the immigrants themselves and the immigrant settlement providers, the actor that actually implement the policy and that make Canada's approach to immigration so amazing, are not properly included in the structures and the institutions that have been created, right? So that's kind of the next challenge. How do we we move to include these non-governmental actors that at the end of the day are the two arms and the two ends of the federal government when it comes to immigration. Thank you. Sunil? Great. Good afternoon, everybody. So just to let you know, inside my brain when I'm giving a talk, there's usually a toggle switch which ranges from zero to ten on the provocative slash cranky <laughs> scale. And there's a number of variables that determine at which point on the toggle I'm going. So one of them is how late in the day is it at a conference? So it's fairly late in the day, which means I'm inclined to go further towards the 10 dial. And the other key fa factor right now is that how tired am I? And I'm very tired because I haven't slept well the last two or three nights. I have 18 month old uh, twins at home. So I'm about at a 10 on the provocative cranky scale. So that kind of underlines the remarks I'm about to make to you on the labor market. So there's three things I'm going to talk to you about in the eight to 10 minutes I've got now. So one, what's the current state of the labor market? Two, what are the current supports and systems and programs that the federal and provincial governments have in place regards to uh, labor market policies and jobs? And third, what are some things we can do about this? And we'll unpack all of this, I'm sure, uh, later on in, in the conversation. So number one, I think we are at the risk of being lulled into a bit of a false sense of security in terms of the quality of the job market in Canada right now. If you look at the job numbers on a monthly basis or over the last year or so, you, you get the headlines that Canada's job, the job, job market is booming. We're back. We're creating all these full-time jobs. Everything is wonderful. Uh, but if you start to dig beneath the level of the aggregate uh, numbers in terms of job creation and GDP growth over the last two or three years, which are generally positive, I will I will say, I think what you find is a relatively troubling signal that a lot of the jobs that we are creating, a lot of the people who are working in these jobs are in fact actually struggling uh, quite a bit. So I'll give you a few stats off the top of my head uh, to reinforce this. So if we look at the broader OECD numbers, 60% of job growth 
uh, in the OECD over the last 20 years or so is in the form of non-standard work. So you're looking at jobs that are temporary, jobs that are part-time, uh, that tend not to have benefits. And if you dig beneath that into the Canadian numbers, the Toronto numbers, uh, the story is much the same. We've seen 50% uh, increase in precarious work in the greater Toronto area, according to United Way and PEPSO. Uh, roughly 40 to 50% of jobs have some element of precarity attached uh, to them, depending on how you define uh, that. And then if you look at things like income levels, if you work in a job in Ontario that, uh, and you're in a profession that is not executive or not professional, so basically most people in the province, in other words, uh, your job, your income growth over the last 20 years in adjusted for inflation terms is flat. So you make exactly the same amount of money in 2016 as you did in 1997. And you can imagine, are all of your other costs flat over that time? So if you're looking at energy, if you're looking at housing, if you're looking at childcare, uh, across the board, all of those things obviously have increased significantly uh, in terms of cost pressures, but your, your paycheck at the end of the day, if you're the average or middle-income Ontarian, is flat, and you have not seen any wage growth uh, in that time. So that, I think that's a relatively troubling uh, uh, figure and perspective to put on these uh, issues. And then if we look at uh, the growth of the so-called gig economy, I mean, this is something you probably hear a lot about in the media, are robots coming to take all of our jobs? Uh, what does that mean for the future of work? Uh, we don't really know. I mean, there are projections that 5% of jobs in countries like Canada could be eliminated due to automation and artificial intelligence all the way up to 50%. Uh, Nobody really knows what's going to happen, but I think we're fairly certain in saying that the future of work is going to be more uncertain. Increasingly, fewer people are going to be in what we call standard employment relationships where they have a job and benefits that attach to their job from their employer. Increasingly, uh, those jobs in the private sector don't have benefits attached to them. They're temporary, they're casual, they're part-time in nature. And this has all kinds of repercussions for people in terms of things like income volatility. Uh, I mentioned uh, income stagnation and a whole range of other uh, issues. So that's the broad sweep of, of the picture of the job market in Canada. I don't think it's as good as maybe the, the numbers or the, the headlines might have you uh, belief. So what does that mean? Do we have programs in place that account for this new world of work where increasingly people uh, maybe bounce between jobs, don't have benefits? Uh, again, short answer is no. Uh, so if you look at a program like employment insurance, for example, fewer than 40% of unemployed Canadians are eligible for uh, EI. That compares to over 80% at the end of the 1970s. The program hasn't really changed, but the kinds of jobs people are doing have changed. So they're not able to pay into EI or they're not eligible for EI for one of a number of different uh, reasons. If you look at things like childcare costs, I think there was a new report out today, I didn't actually get a chance to read it, that I think in Toronto the average childcare cost now is $1,200 uh, a month. That's a concern if you're looking to re-enter the labor market, especially if you're a woman, how do you do that if childcare costs are eating up most of the income you would actually um, get? Things like pensions, um, Skills training is another issue. I mean, if you want to be eligible for government uh, skills training, you generally have to be eligible for EI. And guess what? As I mentioned earlier, fewer than 30% of people in Ontario are eligible uh, for EI. So that means you're not eligible for skills training if we're entering into this tumultuous new world of work. Who's going to be training you? It's not your employer. Employers are actually paying uh, about one-third the amount they did in the early 1990s for skills training for their employees now. Government is not really coming up to the table because people aren't eligible for the skills training. Is the average person really able to go and take a degree or take some kind of upgrades to their skills to get a new job? Probably not because they haven't really been able to save a lot of money given their, their, their income has been relatively uh, flat. So if you look across the board, essentially our social architecture is still rooted in the 1950s and 1960s and premised on the idea that you've got a single breadwinner who's got a pension, bringing home enough money to support a family. That's not the reality of most Canadian families uh, anymore. Uh, so when we put that into the context of federal-provincial relations, what does this mean? Carolyn mentioned off the top, this is one of those areas where each jurisdiction, federal and provincial, have very distinct levers that can be used to influence uh, the labor market, jobs, skills retraining across the board. Uh, and we are seeing some innovation. I mean, I think it's really positive, for example, that Ontario is moving ahead with the basic income uh, pilot. That's a very potentially useful and uh, 
evidence-based approach to what might be a world of work in the future where there are not enough jobs for people, what do we do with those people, how do we support them, how do we give them directly uh, income in their pockets to, uh, to make ends meet. Uh, the federal government's been doing some tweaks to things like EI, CPP, CPP in fact probably initiated by the province moving forward with an Ontario registered uh, pension plan. Uh, but I, I would argue that broadly speaking, in the two minutes I have left, uh, <laughs> broadly speaking, we don't really see transformational change at either the federal or provincial level outside of the basic income. Part. We're seeing incremental tweaks to existing programs, we're seeing add-ons, we're seeing subtractions, we're seeing uh, small adjustments. But I think what we really, even if you hit a pause on changes in the world of work generally as of right now, we would need transformational changes. We'd need to revamp EI, we'd need to revamp skills training, we need to look at issues like affordable housing. I mean, the job market is really one place where people can earn wages to provide for themselves, but governments can also provide a social wage through public expenditures to people. So to reduce your costs of purchasing childcare or reduce your costs uh, of obtaining housing, for example. So that's the lever I think that's really been missing to date, we still assume that the private job market is going to be enough for people to meet their uh, needs. And I think increasingly we're realizing that's probably not the case. And when you look at where's the money going to come from, well, the easy answer is Canada actually has a relatively low tax rate uh, compared to other uh, OECD, OECD jurisdictions. So we have room to increase taxes to provide these uh, public goods and public uh, wages. The question is, do we have the political will and appetite uh, to move there. So hopefully we can unpack some of that in the discussion. Great. Thanks, Sidiel. Go ahead, Thanks. Um, so as Carolyn mentioned, uh, in my spare time, I uh, do digital health, so I, I run a team of developers who make apps, and I even wrote a digital comic book. So you might ask, what does that have to do with the Confederation of Tomorrow? And I hope by the time I'm done, it'll make some sense to you. So to prepare for this, I actually learned a bit about the Confederation of Today, or actually the BNA Act. And uh, I hope I got this correct, but one of the most important components of creating Ca Confederation in Canada was the railway. And uh, the BNA Act included the requirement that a railway would be built in every Canadian province where one did not exist. A and the railway represented this connection between the region and it was a necessity in order to create Confederation. So now, you know, as we're thinking about the Confederation of tomorrow, I guess the question I have is, what will be this modern railway that will shepherd the Confederation of tomorrow? And in my opinion, it's going to be a digital railway. And this connection is no longer going to be between the provinces or between the province and the federal government. It's going to be between you, the citizens of Canada, and your governments, whether they be local, provincial, territorial, or federal. And as importantly, it'll be between each of you in a peer-to-peer -peer con uh, connection. And so I believe this will be the fabric that helps develop the new, con uh, new confederation. And, and this is going to change health and innovation. You know, traditionally, innovation in health has been very sort of top-down. We've had policy make decisions made at the higher level, and it trickles down. But I think increasingly, you're going to start seeing innovation occur at the grassroots level. It'll be everyday Canadians who recognize problems and try to create a solution for those problems. And digital technology will help make that happen. And then those will go to the local level, and then they'll marry with provincial initiatives and ideally eventually move to a pan-Canadian level. So I'd like to give you an example of a project we've been working on, which I think illustrates this new paradigm well of how innovation occurs at the grassroots level and working with the province, you can scale it. So uh, who here knows where their immunization records are? A few people, okay. <laughs> Two things that bring Canadians together is hockey and not knowing where their <laughs> immunization records are. Um, so we've been working on a solution for that and simultaneously actually Ontario has been as well. And uh, so our solution is Can Immunize, which you should download for your kids, track their vaccines. Uh, it's a digital immunization solution. And Ontario is working on the Digital Health Immunization Repository. So, you know, I've been studying immunization public health for a while, so I did all this research and came up with this great idea. Actually, that's not ha what happened. Uh, in 2011, I was in a park talking to another New Brunswicker, uh, a tech-savvy mom, who had complained to me about all these yellow cards she had, and every time she went to the doctor's office, she got another yellow card, and she had to have proof of immunization to get to school, and if she could do her banking on her phone, why the heck can't we put this yellow card on the phone? Which was a great idea, I thought, but I didn't know how to code. Um, but I think for lesson one, innovation comes from, in many respects, everyday Canadians with everyday problems. 
So then at the same time, a first year engineering student wanted a summer job. So uh, I gave him this idea and then I didn't hear from him for the summer. And then he sent me a video saying he taught himself how to code and he built this app. Uh, so lesson two, these uh, dreaded millennials we all talk about are actually going to be the future of our confederation. And they're gonna be the ones driving this innovation and I know they can be difficult, but they're very <laughs> talented and passionate. Um, and I run a team of them. Um, so he, uh, he developed this, this solution, and, uh, and I looked at it and said, all these questions I've been trying to deal with immunization, you know, th this can address. And the Public Health Agency of Canada also saw this. That this is sort of what we've been looking for. And then they supported us developing a pan-Canadian version of this called Can Immunize. So shameless plug, iOS, Android, please download it. It's free, government-endorsed. Sorry if you have a BlackBerry. Um, so, you know, I used to actually study federalism, and I got a little frustrated because of the sense that things weren't moving ahead in public health. And public health programs are very fragmented. Every province has its own immunization program, its own immunization schedule, its own vaccine immunization sheets, its own terminology for immunization. I mean, we live in, and it's in, this is, we had to build an international app, essentially, to accommodate Canada. Um, but the beauty of the digital technology is we can adapt it to each province and territory and the federal government. We can have messaging come from local, provincial, territorial, and federal to an individual based on where they're located, based on their profile and their GPS. We have an outbreak alert system powered by HealthMap and Harvard, which will tell you about outbreaks of vaccine-preventable disease in your vicinity. So this is an example of a federal, provincial, territorial sort of solution using digital technology. And uh, we actually think it can help with supranational issues. The international health regulations have the requirement for yellow fever vaccines. We think that the cap capacity to build a digital sort of immunization passport where you have an authenticated record that would give you proof of that yellow fever vaccine as you're entering a jurisdiction where it's required. But I think most importantly, and this is where our work with Ontario is, is sort of merging, is the capacity to interact with regional immunization information systems. So as I mentioned, uh, while we've been working on our solution, Ontario developed this digital health immunization repository. And their goal is to have a comprehensive assessment of immunization in Ontario, and to also make this data available to Ontarians to make them active partners in managing their health. So it's very similar to our vision. So we've been working with them for a couple of years. And the plan is, and uh, you know, ambitiously, hopefully in the next six months to a year, our app will link with their system. So that means, you will have access through our app to the immunization information that exists in Ontario's repository, and you will also be able to contribute to that information because we now know the practice of immunization is becoming increasingly fragmented as well. We have people moving from other jurisdictions into Ontario, whether they be immigrants or from another province. Uh, and it's also permits a bi-directional communication that can start happening between the government and an individual at the time of the birth of their first child. And I think this is really important because what we're starting to create is this digital connection and ability to start this communication and this rapport. And I think this will build trust and confidence in public health. And this is going to be sort of the social contract that can help develop this sort of confederation of tomorrow. Um, you know, so recognizing this opportunity, that's actually what motivated us to develop the digital comic book, Immunity Warriors, Invasion of the Alien Zombies. Um, that term actually has not been used. Uh, and, and the idea here is parents can use this to, you know, they're, they're already actively managing their child's care. They can now start teaching their children about vaccines and the, uh, the, how important they are and the amazing science behind immunology. We hope this can help battle future vaccine hesitancy and also, you know, get people interested in STEM education. Uh, you know, a sort of a final exciting opportunity, and I think this is sort of the holy grail of what we're working towards, is if and when this works, um, you will be downloading potentially an authenticated version of a health record from Ontario into this device. Then when you move to another province, you can potentially then download this information into their immunization repository. So we had to build a translator, the Canadian Vaccine Catalog, to allow that to happen, and, and that's also a requirement for us under our contract. And so we are now moving towards portable digital medical records. You know, we're just, we're looking at immunization, but this is potentially could be done with any other medical information. And now we are moving towards a pan-Canadian solution for problems that, you know, many Canadians are, are struggling with. So, you know, I think our project is just one example, uh, but I see it representative of what will connect this country in the future. 
Uh, so these are solutions aimed at the individual where they're empowered to either manage their own health care or other issues that they have to deal with in everyday life. And solutions whereby a communication link is formed between governments and its citizens. And in many instances, I think digital technology is going to help make this happen. Thanks very much to all three. Uh, I would like to take a few minutes now to try to draw some uh, connections across the three presentations and raise some potentially common themes. And one that strikes me is the, um, in, in each of these areas, there's, uh, quite apart from the constitutional uh, allocation of responsibilities, there are dimensions of the policy that call for a pan-Canadian or a nationwide response. So particularly in the case of, of immigration and uh, the labor market, we think about the mobility of persons as something that we either want to actively encourage or at least not impede. Um, and yet, in the, in the immigration field, we've seen a dramatic rise in the proportion of immigration that comes through the provincial nominee program. Uh, so province-specific criteria for, uh, <clears throat> for immigrant selection. Uh, and yet, the potential for those uh, new Canadians to move to wherever they wish. Uh, similarly, in uh, labor market policy, if provinces are going to be investing heavily in uh, training, um, there's, a, there's a, an issue of, uh, of the um, a loss of that investment as uh, crudely as, uh, as the beneficiaries move to other provinces. And uh, so, that, so on the mobility issues, I'd like to hear from Mireille and, and Sunil. And then, uh, Kuminen, on the, just to pick up on where you left off, um, uh, one of the pan-Canadian dimensions of uh, information technology that you've been dealing with is the challenge of developing platforms whereby these various applications can actually talk to each other. Uh, not an area in which Canada has distinguished itself in international perspective. So I'd like to hear a little more about uh, what, the, what the potential, uh, what the, uh, how we can overcome the challenges in that area that we've, uh, we've, rec we've had to confront in the past. But first let me go back to the mobility questions and, and ask uh, my first two colleagues to address those. Sure. Um, Oh, oh. No, you can go first. Okay, please, thank please. you. Um, so this is a really important question. And um, so the first thing I think, uh, whenever we were having this discussion, is to realize that while provinces are developing uh, provincial nominee streams uh, based on their own labor market needs, they're also not creating things that are completely um, opposed to the federal skilled workers categories and things like that, right? So we're not seeing such a major differences between the people coming in. So the impact is presence of, of, of the potential, um, the potential impact, I'm sorry, of people being nominated in one province and then moving to another one is not as dramatic as if it was a clear free for all. But to me, the issue is really one in which provinces need to realize that selecting immigrants properly, and I, I say provinces, but actually Ottawa is moving in that direction as well. Proper selection and efficient selection is not the only solution, right? It can't be enough. You can't kind of build a formula to find the right person at the right moment. You need to work on what we call pull factors, right? It's making mm. sure that the place you're getting people in is in a place is a place where people are going to want to stay. Um, we can force them right. to stay because of our constitution, but we can make sure not only that they're going to get their credential recognized, which is something that both Ottawa and the provinces can act on. We also need to make sure that you know the area is ready to welcome them, um, and this is something I think that can be developed a lot more by provinces. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the labor market, I think one of the things we're lacking in Canada is a national skill strategy. I mean, there's a huge focus on what are the skills of the future. We've got the federal government, the provinces, private sector, uh, institutions like universities and colleges. 
uh, involved in that equation and nobody really has a clear sense of what the incentives are. So I mean, you mentioned the, the leakage issue of maybe I train somebody in Ontario and the province is putting money into me and then I decide, oh, I'm gonna go to BC and I've got a better job. There, that shouldn't really matter. Like we should really be focused on what is right. best for the individual in this case and what's best for, for Canada. But I, could, I can certainly see it. I think there are examples of misaligned incentives creating uh, perhaps hesitance on the part of provinces or third-party service providers to provide training to somebody that they don't think uh, is going to stay in their jurisdiction for uh, example. So, I mean, to me, this all calls for uh, a better sense of what is the system, let's map the system, let's make sure all incentives are pulling in the right direction. Uh, and the outcome of that is we want the most highly skilled, best trained workforce in the world, bar none, and how do we get uh, there? And I mean, the big answer to that that nobody likes to talk about is we don't invest nearly enough into this area uh, as other jurisdictions. I mean, we mentioned we're at the bottom of the OECD rankings compared to countries like Denmark. Uh, we probably spend about one-sixth the amount per capita that those countries do on active labor market uh, policy. So if you don't spend enough money and a lot of the programs aren't working that well, you're not really going to get good uh, results. So I think we really need to take a step back develop a strategic framework that says, what, what do we want skills to look like in Canada in the 21st century? Let's get all the partners at the table and let's invest the hell out of that system so that we, so that we can build that system. Um, and the question you bring up is a really good one and it's a huge challenge. Um, I mean, the federal government can't mandate a common set of standards. They can provide guidance. Uh, you know, groups like Canada Health InfoWay are, you know, have, some, have a, uh, some responsibility for that. But ultimately, province and the territory that are going to choose the solution that they're most comfortable with. But it's even worse than that. Even within a province, you can have multiple solutions. Right, right. And like, you know, we have a pilot with Ottawa where you can report your immunization status. To replicate that across Ontario, we're going to have to get 36 information sharing agreements signed. And each system is somewhat di different. So that's just Ontario. Um, so, you know, I, again, I come back to the fundamental concept, though, and I remember working at a downtown hospital in Toronto, and someone from across the street would come over who had just admitted in another downtown hospital, and, you know, we couldn't access their system. It, it would have been really great if they had their information on them. So, you know, I increasingly believe the solution is going to be you're in charge of your own health care, your own health information, you have every right to own it, it's yours, and then it's the responsibility of that information, of the system that you move to, to be able to upload that information. And you know, there are translation systems and such, but um, you know, I, I think that will be the future. Okay. So to what extent um, do we have the, the vehicles uh, necessary to, um, to pursue the lines of development that you, all three of you have been uh, discussing both in your presentations and just now? Um, are they, uh, are, Bilateral agreements the way to go in terms of labor market agreements, immigration agreements, uh, are pan-Canadian structures like Canada InfoWay, I mean, what, what structural changes should we be making, or not, as the case may be, if we really want to encourage provincial level innovation within, uh, while recognizing these pan-Canadian uh, imperatives? I'll, I'll take a quick okay. rough crack at this. So I, think, I think there's four or five characteristics of social programs and policies we'll look to in the future, and probably, I mean, quite honestly, most government programs and policies, they need to be more integrated, so we need to see better integration of what the federal government's doing with the provinces, with municipalities, with outside service uh, providers, and there are frameworks for doing that in lots of different jurisdictions. We just have to get to the hard work of actually uh, doing it. I think they're going to be digital. So as Kuminen mentioned, increasingly services will be digital, they will be portable, uh, and that's one thing we need to drive forward on. Uh, third, they're going to be outcomes-based. So we're going to be actually driving towards the outcome we want is highly skilled workforce, however you want to define that. It's not uh, third-party service providers seeing people at a resume workshop and ticking a box saying, yes, we saw it. That's not an outcome, that's an output. Yeah, we saw 50 people, but that's not really getting us good value for money. Um, as citizens. So I think, I mean, those kinds of characteristics are increasingly the kinds of characteristics we're going to see social programs need to adopt uh, in the future. And we have existing pathways and forums to do all of those things. It's just a matter of getting governments together and, and, and getting that work uh, done. Because I mean, quite honestly, a job seeker or somebody losing their job because of automation or because their manufacturing plant 
get shut down, does not care if it's the federal government or provincial <laughs> government or municipal government who's providing the service. All they care about is, is somebody going to help me find another job? And governments need to step away from the jurisdictional uh, battles around these issues and say, what is in the client's best interest? And that's probably the fourth issue I wanted to raise is client-centered approach is not government-centered from this silo. We have EI from this silo at the provincial level. We have social assistance. We don't really consider how those two marry up. So when somebody's off EI, they now have to deplete all their assets to become eligible for social assistance. That's not in anybody's uh, interest. So integrated, citizen-centered, digitized, uh, whatever the fourth one I said was. But I think that's the framework for social programs in the future. Mm. I, I feel that to be a bit optimistic here, we're actually moving in the right direction. I'm, I'm starting to, the culture is changing. These initiatives are being supported. Again, I think like we have our, our, the next generation is going to be sort of making this all happen. We're moving away from hierarchical relationships in healthcare to, to more equivalent relationships, uh, collaborative. So it's, I think that the trends are there. Um, you know, I think this has to be organic to a large extent. I don't think you can, you know, my frustration in studying this is just these 20, 10 year plans and these massive investments. And I mean, digital technology moves so fast. Like I, one of them in immunization, I mean, by the, the project began before smartphones existed, so they couldn't adapt to smartphones. And you know, we have to be agile, that's the, the, the term is rapid agile development, you know, create minimal viable product and iterate based on feedback. You know, this is going to be the new paradigm, and I, I think we're moving in that direction, the sense I'm getting from the province and territories and the commitment to sort of patient-centered care. Thanks. Hillary? Just to add, I feel, like, <clears throat> I feel like in terms of infrastructures, we have agreement in the immigration sectors, we have working groups, we have meetings. Um, so it seems to me like the, you know, the stable stuff is there, um, but it's, as I was saying, more practice dependent, right? So, yes. um, so to me, uh, a lot of it has to, um, has to do with maintaining trust uh, on both sides, right? It's for Ottawa to trust the provinces and to realize that they're, well, relatively, I used to say they were new, but they're not really new anymore at this, but while they're new players or emerging players, they do have their own interests at heart, right? And they're not only going at it um, to get more um, investor immigrants, but are also going at, their, at it to rebuild their society. And I think uh, that trust and that respect has to go there. Uh, provinces have to have reasons to trust, um, to trust Ottawa. Um, and as I was saying, that comes with consistency and efficiency. Um, and then um, it seems to me as well that it also rests on engagement because in the case of immigration, we've always had a shared jurisdiction. The difference is that it wasn't embodied and nobody was actually engaging in it. Right? So as long as we can make sure that both order or government are using and are really engaging in those infrastructures, we'll be, well, fine. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Just one other thing I would add is I think there's a increasingly going to be a big issue around path dependence. I think you yeah. kind of touched on this in terms of we need to be agile, we need to be uh, able to respond to facts on the ground. Increase it. I mean, most government levers tend to be long-term levers, so COYA or LMDA is like their five, six, seven-year mm -hmm. agreements. But the facts on the ground can change very quickly nowadays, and if we need to adjust a program two years in, three years in, we need to have off-ramps so that we can do that, and we're not dependent on a certain path that was developed in 2011 or in a 10-year plan 2007, and then the whole world has changed from a technology or uh, economic point of view, and we have no, we have no recourse. We're stuck in the, the agreement we signed seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, years ago. So I think increasingly we need to move towards that agile approach where we, we are not path dependent, which government tends to be pretty uh, not so great at. It's interesting, as I, as I listen to this, I'm contrasting the potential today with the potential of the first confederation uh, uh, for tomorrow conference. And at that time, in the 60s, the, at least in social policy, the driving force was executive federalism. It was, the, it was the federal and provincial executives acting together. And what I'm hearing more from this panel is the drivers today are the inclusion of, of new groups, different groups. I mean, certainly, uh, as we heard in the last panel, uh, the, the um, need to develop a new relationship with indigenous peoples potential to transform the federation. Um, 
and including uh, non-state actors, as we political scientists say, in, these, in the, the um, intergovernmental agreements, the dynamism of technology, these are the, these are the potentially transformative forces for the Confederation of Tomorrow 2.0, as opposed to the executive federalism of 1.0. Uh, that's more a comment than a, than a question. If you're welcome to, uh, to pitch in um, on it. Yeah, I mean, or, one of the uh, things, I'm probably gonna get the technology wrong here. <laughs> I should, I my team's gonna be embarrassed, but um, they sort of point out to me that with the, the way these health information systems are moving with uh, blockchain technology, they may not even need to reside centrally anywhere. This information could all be federated. And you can use blockchain technology to authenticate them. So you know, we might move from a system where we, it was all about federal provincial relationships, where now it'll be all about peer-to-peer -peer communication. Okay. And I think increasingly, I mean, in society, uh, we're seeing atomization of individuals. We're not seeing that relationship being as critical. Government, large intermediaries and individuals, we're seeing more person-to-person -person relationships, person direct with government rather than through an intermediary. Uh, so some of these technologies like blockchain, the sharing economy can enable that. It's just a question of can governments harness those opportunities while regulating to mitigate the risks that are associated with these things in terms of data privacy and so on. Okay. We have about uh, a little more than 10 minutes now for, well, no, we have 10 minutes uh, for, uh, for questions. Um, do, uh, do feel free to summon the mic. I know it's the end of the day, and the question period stands between you and a reception. This is not incentives to ask questions, but do. <laughs> Do feel free. Yeah, I know, far yeah. be it for me to keep us from alcohol, but. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so thanks, guys. This was a great panel again. Um, Kamal, actually, my question's to you. Um, it, it, one of the risks sometimes that people like myself get preoccupied with if we think that individuals should be responsible for records like this is, is that it responsibilizes people um, and can potentially have very negative effects for marginalized populations within countries. Um, and it's the same problem with using the language like clients, right, instead of citizens. Mm. And so I'm just wondering, you know, how you, how you kind of square that circle um, if you're trying to make sure that all populations would have access to that type of technology um, and, uh, and have that in their hands. Um, so just want to make sure, you're, you're worried that marginalized populations may not have access to the same technology, or you're worried that providing them with the information can be harmful? Uh, no, not providing them with the information. It's okay. that if you say to governments, um, and if you offload the responsibility for maintaining okay. records of that nature to individuals, so then it's no longer the responsibility of governments to maintain giant clouds, databases, blah, blah, blah. You run the risk that only certain types of the population, I'm, you know, I'm now thinking about, uh, you know, kind of a day after tomorrow or, uh, you know, whatever, I don't know, Hunger Games type model, right? Um, where, uh, you know, you can see um, potentially a leader in power saying, ah, you know, it's not going to be our problem anymore to maintain these records. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think we need a transition period to solve that, and there'll be dual holding of records by individuals and central repositories. Um, you know, I was one of the things I was reflecting on. The era of policy over with the advent of technology, but actually I think we're in a new era of policy because of all of these challenges and questions that technology is going to create. And so you know, I think there's going to be a huge need to figure out how to solve these type of issues. Um, and it's, again, there's this thing called adaptive policy making. The policy is going to have to become agile and rapidly be able to address these because you know, this is one of many type of issues that's going to come up. Um, and, and so I, I, my preference on that one would be having a dual uh, option of holding the information. Thank you. Um, I want to, this question is sort of immigration and uh, uh, labor <coughs> market. Um, and it arises out of, uh, uh, in the, my years working, I've been involved with uh, youth employment and also uh, citizenship issues. And more recently, as a volunteer in York Region, we have what's called the Human Services Planning uh, Board. And 
it's the role of not the province or the federal government, but increasingly of uh, larger and more sophisticated uh, nonprofits. Um, in our area, uh, the United Way of Greater uh, Toronto, which now encompasses uh, Toronto, York Region, and Peel, uh, the YMCA, which uh, <coughs> covers uh, the whole area, and a number of other players who began as um, immigrant uh, uh, groups, sort of solely, Costi, for example, uh, the several uh, Chinese-based uh, groups, but which now really are, <coughs> you know, dealing with everybody. Um, so it seems to me, and what, what we've noticed, is that they play a really critical role and can be extremely good in terms of innovation and so on, but that one of the frustrations at times is they need to be empowered. Um, and it, it sort of gets to the question you were talking about, you know, if you've got a seven-year agreement or a ten-year agreement, but things are changing, you know, how do you get <clears throat> so you can, you can make those changes? So what, because you both sort of mentioned uh, those players, um, how would you see them uh, being involved in, you know, ongoing discussions of what, what are the appropriate programs that we should be having at the local level? Um, so maybe I can start yeah, in the immigration sector. I mean, I'm really happy you're raising that because to me, uh, you know, especially as I travel uh, in other countries, it becomes evident that they are the gem of Canada's model, right? Like you can't think about the way Canada welcomes immigrants without understanding the work that is being done and the capacity of these players. So just a couple of things. So in addition to get them much more involved to, uh, in some of the institutions we were talking about. I think two things that are always raised and that are worth raising again is, you know, making sure that there is funding to do other things than just seeing people, right? Uh, Overhead, um, as we were talking in the first, uh, in, in the previous panel too, right? There, you need time to innovate. You need time to think through things. You need uh, a capacity to go to conferences, to talk to one another, and so making sure that um, funding respects that and funding allows for that would be really important. And the second thing is obviously multi-year funding. So that varies from provinces to province. In Quebec, there has been traditionally a lot more capacity for these organizations to receive multi-year funding, and what we've seen is how much um, it breeds, uh, first off, like amazing settlement workers. I mean, settlement workers are amazing across the country. Um, uh, but having job security for these people and adding the capacity to develop new pilot projects at the local level. So these two things that are quite simple and are, I mean, I feel like we've been talking about this for 10 years, but are really, really important in our work repeating. So I'd agree with both of those things. The a third thing I would add is, I mean, there's a lot of incredibly valuable information that's being gathered by third-party service providers in yeah. Canada. There is really no mainstream vehicle for collecting that information, figuring out what works, and then disseminating that information out to all of the other players in the sector, other service providers, back to provincial or federal government. So I mean, in the UK, they've got what's called what works centers. So we can move towards models like that in areas like job training or in immigration resettlement or uh, other, so I think learning from these service providers, not just kind of saying, well, you're delivering services for us, don't come out back and tell us about anything that you've learned and just keep doing what you're doing is not really a productive, well, these people have incredibly, and organizations have incredibly valuable uh, knowledge, and if governments really want to reap the benefits of entering into third-party service agreements, they need to use those organizations as sensors, pull that information back into the system, and then deploy it back out into the system so we're driving towards better uh, outcomes. But I think, I mean, there's a whole range of challenges when it comes to working with the NFP sector from the sector's point of view, and funding is just, just at the tip of the iceberg. Um, sorry, I just want to—I uh, just want to ask you a few more questions on that point that you just raised, which is really interesting for me because um, I'm, an, I'm an economist. I play a lot with a lot of data, and uh, data that I really got into recently is uh, one from Indeed.com and secondly from Google Trends. So Google Trends it compiles people's search results, and it has been a news uh, years ago because using people's search results, it was able to accurately predict where the next flu outbreak will be. So. I play with this data and using people's uh, searches on real estate or people's searches on uh, our cars, trucks, and such, I'm able to predict pretty accurately 
auto sales, <laughs> one or two quarters ahead. So this data that exists, and we know that there's privacy concerns with uh, Facebook, privacy concerns with Google and some of the other organizations, but has there been any initiative by government or governments to extract <laughs> that data and bring that back to the public sphere? Because it's, it's very rich and there's a lot of insights you can pull from that. So I, I mean, I know in terms of like food inspections, New York City has uh, experimented with looking at Yelp reviews and figuring out where the next food out, foodborne illness outbreak could be because if you feel sick after eating at a Mexican restaurant, well, I shouldn't name a specific kind of restaurant, but a <laughs> restaurant, uh, and you go on and review it and say, I got really sick after eating it, then and five people do the same review, that helps target your enforcement efforts. Uh, in that so I think governments, are, I mean, that's one example. There are a few others from around the world, but governments are starting to realize there's a whole world of data out there, companies like Google and Uber and Airbnb are data powerhouses. They're incredibly good at analyzing and refining their services based on data. I think governments are starting to get on that uh, pathway. The challenge for governments is going to be capacity. How do you compete yeah. uh, with firms paying three, four hundred thousand dollars a year to fresh uh, graduates when you can say, I'll give you fifty thousand dollars and you can live in Ottawa uh, for a few years and do data analytics for the federal government? I'd probably choose going to California and working for a, for a tech. Uh, firm, but you're going to need to see more talent that has that kind of capacity get into government so that we can uh, make government's data powerhouses too. Just to conclude, like, let me, to, oh, did you have yeah, a point just on that? to add to yeah. that, I mean, a, a huge strategic advantage for Canada uh, in the new economy of our public health system in the sense that it's a comprehensive database. Uh, there are very few other countries that have this volume of population, this all on a, potentially on a single uh, you know, health information system. Um, and I, I don't think we've utilized that. I think we do a great job with that for research, but I think there are huge economic, untapped economic opportunities there that, that uh, have been unexploited. Okay. So to, to conclude, let me uh, just ask for maybe one minute from each of you on the following question. The 1960s were a time we've alluded to of uh, a burst of social policy change in a number of key areas in health policy, pension policy, social assistance policy, among others. Uh, immigration policy, indeed, uh, to some extent. Um, to what extent do you see the present as, a, as, a, as ripe for that sort of burst of policy change, or do you see a kind of continued incremental development along the lines that we've established? And I don't mean to suggest that one course is necessarily better than the other, but just what, what kind of dynamic do you think we're in at the moment? So maybe start with coming in at the other end and work this way. I see two dynamics separately. I see a bit of the, the old school sort of incrementalism, but then I see, see on the other end this disruption that's happening. Um, you know, I think they're going to end up in the middle somewhere. I think we're gonna probably have to slow down some of our disruption to allow policy initiatives to be put into place that allow society to deal with the disruption. But at the same time, I think the old ways of sort of making policy, those are gonna to have to speed up. So I'd agree with that. I think what we're also going to see is a, a bit of a race to the top in terms of social policies and programs amongst advanced economies as people, or sorry, as jurisdictions increasingly compete for top talent, whether it's people or firms like Amazon headquarter or two. Uh, it's where do those people want to live who are highly educated, highly mobile, and they can pick anywhere else in the world to live. They're going to want to live in places that have uh, demonstrated inclusive growth, that have affordable housing, that have good public education systems so that they can raise their families uh, there. So the quicker that countries like Canada can get on with improving social programs, whether it's through ruthless incrementalism or some big bang transformational changes, those jurisdictions are likely to be the ones that are most successful in a digital economy where talent and corporations are so highly mobile. In the immigration sector, um, two things are going to happen as far as I'm concerned. We're going to keep going in terms of inter 
incremental growth, right? So uh, Canada is, I like to tell my student, addicted to immigrants, but that's the wrong term, but we depend on them, right? So, um, and as Doug Sanders was talking about over lunch, uh, we need to grow the population. So um, we're gonna keep having um, that, uh, that slow but very powerful push towards more immigrants. But on the other end, clearly, with the international context that we're facing, we're also gonna see a lot of new responses in Canada, but they're not necessarily gonna come from inside. They're really gonna come from Canada's response to changes in the global world. Well, thank you very much. I think that was a dynamic panel worthy of a dynamic federation. Uh, please join me in thanking all three of our speakers.